The next year, man, I mean, it was like, Sharon's like, where is that financial piece again? <laughs> you have heard of Dave Ramsey. He is a national radio host, a TV personality, a best-selling author, and he's the money management expert behind Financial Peace University. He is now the CEO of Ramsey Solutions, and he has a really popular story. He and his wife went bankrupt when they were young, then he rebuilt his life and started a business that grew from a church Sunday school class into a media empire employing more than 500 people. Along the way, he wrote five New York Times best-selling books. He grew Grew his audience to over 12 million weekly listeners and has had more than 4 million customers go through his flagship program. So I jumped at the chance to join him at Ramsey Solutions in Nashville, Tennessee recently and ask him how he bounced back and built his mission into a massive success. But I will tell you guys, I was pretty nervous for this one because I only had 30 minutes and I had heard he's a bit of a stickler when it comes to time. So we didn't get to do fast facts at the end and there are many questions that I didn't get to, but I still think you'll hear some fresh insights and new stories from him in this interview. Thank you for joining me for another episode of The Pursuit. You guys know where I am. I'm freaking out. I'm very excited. When I started the show, people were like, Dave doesn't do very many interviews. He's really hard. And of course, I was like, challenge accepted. And I'm so, <laughs> so, so excited to be here. Thank you so much, Dave. Well, thanks. I hope you're not underwhelmed. <laughs> uh, no, I'm definitely not. This is really cool. Um, all right. So with my guests, of course, I, I you... Anyone who wants to know about business, finance, or you know what a small business should do with money and all of that, there's so much content. But our job today is to get into how you built your empire and some of those business strategies, which you talk about in Entree Leadership, which mm -hmm. we'll talk about as well. So let's go back to the beginning. Okay. About 28 years ago, last mm -hmm. month, you are bankrupt. Mm -hmm. You go bankrupt in your real estate business. And then um, you decide to learn about money and how money really works. You build things back up. You go back into real estate and you start counseling people, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so then four years later, you actually launch Ramsey Solutions. So what I want to know is kind of what happened in those four years. How did you know you were ready to really go all in on the financial coaching? Mm. What happened was we were trying to survive. <laughs> we were trying to eat. Uh, I had a brand new baby and a toddler, and our marriage had the crud beat out of it, and I was just trying to make a living. And um, I was good enough at real estate thinking I, that I got back to six figures pretty quick. Oh, okay. And, uh, but I had the IRS dogging me, and I had other stuff still chasing me after the bankruptcy, and I, man, it just took a while to clean it up. And uh, the coaching thing, you know, and, and a little bit of speaking here and there started to grow. And um, really, God started to speak to us that this is what He wanted us to do. And uh, we, we printed up the little financial peace book. I actually started on a little radio station. But all of that was very part time. Mm -hmm. And I was still doing real estate to eat. Mm -hmm. And then in April of 94, I guess it was, um, we opened the doors again. And Sharon and I sat down and looked at it. And we said, okay, now that we've got all this stuff cleaned up, we can probably live on about 60000 a year. We were making about 120000 140000 something like that. And um, so, you know, it, even if it goes badly, mm -hmm. we'll probably be okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this is what we're supposed to do. And we felt really a, a prodding from the Lord to do it. And so we stepped out on that, and <laughs> sure enough, we made 62000 <laughs> the next <laughs> year. Yeah, yeah, the next year, man. I mean, it was like, Sharon's like, where is that financial piece again? <laughs> So. Okay, so did you do any marketing like on the ground, you trying to build those seminars, or was it just organic that it went from your Sunday school class to like 300 people? Uh, it was a lot of, of uh, one-off speaking engagements. I okay. took every speaking engagement. Anytime anybody let me talk anywhere, mm. whether they paid me or not. If I could okay. just go talk to the Kiwanis Club, the you know some little dinky but Sunday school class, uh, I could talk to anything anybody let me talk to. Mm -hmm. I'd go talk, just keynotes, a lot of those, and... Or, or if they'd let me be involved in their their little thing they were doing. And we put together a few one-day events and that kind of thing. We were on the radio, but it was like 35 or 40 people coming to them. I mean, okay. it was like we were, we were, it was awful. And the first <laughs> the first night we set up the overhead projector. Remember those days? Uh, you don't, but... Uh, <laughs> Barely. The overhead projector, and the uh, first night we set it up, we had 
seats for 135 people for Financial Peace University. Uh, at that time, we called it Life After Debt. And uh, so we were just knew we were going to change the world, and four people came. Four people. <laughs> wow. Sold three of them, but only four people came. Yeah. And then the next week, I got three more, and the next week, I got four more. And mm. Now almost five million people have been through that, and that kind of, that's kind of crazy. Wow, that is crazy. So let's talk about radio. How did you connect with Blake? How did you, did you have a vision to be on radio? Were you someone who was like, someday I'm going to be on radio stations? Oh, no. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. No, I backed into radio. Uh, There's a little radio station uh, here in Nashville that was in bankruptcy. And uh, one of the guys on there was doing this horrible talk radio show. I mean, it was bad. <laughs> it was uh, just about finance. And he would bring in any ripoff author that had any kind of get-rich-quick scheme and put them on the air and promote their ridiculous seminars and books it was it was bad it was like a Saturday Night Live skit bad financial hour and uh, I was in this real estate club so I went on there as a guest to promote some guy coming to speak at our real estate club hmm. and we, he and I ran out of things to talk about we didn't know what we were doing he didn't know what he was doing and nobody was listening anyway but our wives so <laughs> it didn't matter but uh, he said so what are you what are you doing after a year what are you doing to recover because I know you went bankrupt because he had gone through bankruptcy hmm. and I said well I'm helping some people over at my church I helped a guy the other day stop it at the repo in his car and another couple helped him keep from getting evicted and he goes hey if anybody out there has got any troubles call in and phone started ringing well he oh. never got any calls he didn't know what to do he's like what's that and so um, <laughs> he started taking calls but anyway the long and the short of that is is that he quit I went down and took the thing just as a ministry, just for fun, mm. a one hour a day show, uh, me and two other guys. And I did it two days a week, another guy did it two days a week, another guy did it one day a week. Mm. And both of them eventually quit. And uh, that, sh that station got sold out of bankruptcy uh, to Gaylord. And about that time, we started realizing we were having ratings, mm. that there were people actually okay. listening. Mm -hmm. And so I hired Blake to come in as my first guy uh, to be my producer, engineer, all things radio. And um, he, he came in 20, 20 years ago now to help us syndicate the show and help us get the show formatted and all that kind of stuff. And he didn't know what he was doing either. For us. We, were, <laughs> we just worked through this together a little bit at a time. So that's great talking about your first hire. Let's talk about that. All of a sudden, you know, you're seeing some momentum. You've got one guy partnered with you. Then how did you grow it into what is now this amazing Ramsey Solutions? But let's talk about the first few years. You know, it... Uh, I think the first few hires were just the hardest um, because I was so bad at it. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just like, I got work to do. You want to help me get the work done? And people would say, yeah, I'll give you money to help me get the work done. And I thought everybody that came to work like worked, but they don't. And I thought they'd like tell the truth and that they would talk about you behind your back. And I just thought people were, but good Lord. I mean, the stuff, the drama and the stuff we've been through. But... Um, so how'd you overcome that? Uh, just a little bit at a time. We started recognizing, okay, here's a behavior we're not going to sanction. Hmm. And we start talking about it, and the talking about it became a value, and the value become a cultural icon. And so, you know, we don't do gossip. And so we are all self-employed. We all act like we're self-employed around here. And so, hmm. you know, with the momentum theorem, and this and that and this and that, and we just, it, you know, once we start saying, okay, this is how we want business to be done, this is who we are, if you align with that, you're going to get to like be here. If you don't, then we're going to set you free in Jesus' name. And so <laughs> we set some folks free in Jesus' name for different things. But um, And some of them quit because they just thought we were weird, and we are weird. But this is how we do it, and if you want to play on this team, this is the colors we wear, you know. Yeah. And you just, a little bit at a time, we've cleaned it up and learned. And I'm a lot better leader than I was when I was 32 years old. I'm 56 and old and I mean, I've got all these scars and all these stupid things I've done, and so I'm just, man, I can see stuff now, and I just cut through the bull really, really fast, and um, I'm, I'm, in, in some ways, I'm a, a lot quicker to solve things, but in other ways, I'm a lot kinder than I was, because I was more of a boss than I was a leader when mm. I started, and uh, just like, do this, do that, and, and now we set in place a culture and a process and vision and strategic priorities, and everybody knows where we're going, and we're all aligned, and all these things that intellectually you think you should you should know but I didn't and so hmm. um, we've a little bit at a time gotten better and better I want to talk about culture but first let's pause because back then your first book you had worked on financial peace 
actually publishing it, right? Self-publish. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And you're trying to get more radio stations. And you're scaling suddenly this business. Mm -hmm. What was the average day like for you back then? Uh, it was ridiculous. <laughs> um, because what I would do is the radio station that carried the radio show is where we housed the show. So it was over at Opryland, which is 25 minutes from our home and our office. And, and so I would have to drive over there every afternoon and do a three-hour show. And then I was teaching Financial Peace University every night oh. with an overhead projector. And then I'm running the business around that. And so, you know, I'm in the office at 7 or 8 a.m., work up until 12-something and jump in the car and drive 100 miles an hour over to the radio station, do three hours, drive back, go over to the Holiday Inn, set up the overhead projector and the screens and the chairs and everything, come back over, take a shower, shave again, Go back over there, teach, lead the small groups, pray with a single mom who's scared to death, and it's 11.30 when I'm taking the screen down. And so I was doing 16-hour days in those days. It was nuts. I didn't do that for a long time, but there was a period of about, I don't know, 18 months, 24 months or something like that, that that was the schedule. It was it was crazy. But everything, but Financial Peace University was growing so fast at night. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had three, 400 people coming out. We would rent the... We rented not only the, the ballroom to do the teaching, but then we ended up, to do the small groups, we ended up renting all the sleeping rooms on the first room, flip the beds up to the wall, and everybody would break out and go into there, and then we'd have to put it all back down and go back the next day and do it all again. And so um, it was this ridiculous setup and teardown thing, but it was the only way we could get scale to it in those days because it wasn't on video, and it was mm. just, it was all the logistics of it was just a nightmare, but but people were grabbing a hold of it. It was really expensive. I mean, we charged like $569 to go through it then. Yeah. And it's 89 now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was just, but but it was still, it was worth $10,000, still worth $10,000 to go through it. I think that shows, I mean, I think entrepreneurs like to be fast paced. We kind of have ADD, I've heard you say that, that we just want to do a lot of things. Now you have this giant organization. Do you ever feel like you're moving at a snail's pace? Do you ever miss that fast paced entrepreneurship of the small business? Uh, we have lots of small businesses in here okay. that are fast paced, that are doing their thing, and they're they're doing they're not quite that primitive that I described a minute ago, mm -hmm. because they've got all the rest of us with our arms around them, helping them and moving them. But in terms of getting an idea to market, and you know, going from brainstorm to market, what are the steps and how fast can we do it? We're pretty pretty nimble. Um, we don't want to get uh, we don't want to slow down like that. So each of, we've got nine different profit centers in the business, and so each of those are small businesses. Mm -hmm and uh, pretty large small businesses in some cases, but they're still very nimble and they can launch things. And you know, with internet connectivity, to, you know, we started, Al Gore hadn't even invented the internet yet. So, you know, this is all new and with all the things we can do with the web now, you can take stuff to market blindingly fast. Mm -hmm. and, or you can try ideas or test ideas or, or run a beta out there, whatever the concept is. And our guys here hustle, man, and, and we hustle and grind and get it out. So we're still pretty nimble, but it's just like, the whole thing doesn't move. It's more like that one runs over there and that one runs over there and that kind of a thing. Coming up, don't miss his number one piece of advice for success. But first, I want to tell you guys about something really exciting, a really cool tool. If you're a freelancer, if you have a service-based business, if you're sending out a bunch of invoices and hopefully getting in a bunch of money, but you're not really all that organized, you have trouble keeping track of your time when you're doing hourly paid tasks, and you probably are a little bit disheveled when it comes to making your invoices and getting them sent out, you have got to check out FreshBooks Cloud Accounting app, you guys. It's a cloud piece of software, which means you're not downloading anything to your computer. You can use it on your phone or use it on your desktop. It is the easiest piece of software ever. You can seriously just sign up and within 30 seconds, you're making an invoice, you're throwing your logo and your colors on there. If you wanna use the time tracker within the app when you start a task, you can associate it with a client right off the bat. You can run reports, you can see what invoices are past due. If like me, you use one particular credit card for your business expenses, you can sync that to FreshBooks and it'll bring in those charges and categorize them for you. It's gonna save you so much time and energy at the worst time of the year, which is tax season, am I right? So you definitely wanna check this out. They're offering a free 30-day trial right now. Go to freshbooks.com slash pursuit, or if you go and it pops up and asks, where did you hear about us? Put in The Pursuit, and then you can get a free 30-day trial to try it for yourself. Seriously, you guys, you're going to love it. You can thank me later. Again, that's freshbooks.com slash pursuit.
I also wanted to remind you guys about the three best ways to support the show, this free show here for you on the internet. Number one, share this video with someone. Share it with your followers, share it with one of your fellow hustlers you know will like this video. Number two, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. And number three, most importantly, go to the pursuit.tv slash magazine and sign up for our once a month emails. You will get a free edition of the monthly magazine, which goes behind the scenes for every interview that month. And it will give you some really awesome articles and worksheets. It's totally free. It's only once a month, the pursuit.tv slash magazine. Now let's get back into the show. You've done that a lot, testing things, getting it out to market. And now you work with so many entrepreneurs across the U.S. What's maybe some mistakes people make? getting things out, um, launching products, launching, you know, maybe even launching their business, but some things you see people maybe should do or shouldn't do. The mistake, uh, the mistake that I made, and I think I see it a lot as well, was that y you get so enamored with your idea, <laughs> and it's yeah. like your child, it's like nobody's yeah. kids, no, nobody's baby's <laughs> ugly, and yet there's some ugly babies, but, you know, I mean, but my baby's not ugly, and, right. you know, you get so enamored with the, the thing that you don't realize that you're probably going to crush that thing about six times. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 1.0 version is never going to be where you end up, mm -hmm. and uh, you're going to, in our culture today, with the rate of change we have, you're going to iterate, and if you don't iterate, you're going to die, yeah. and so don't get too... Uh, married to your first version okay because it's not going to be the only thing you ever do you know right. and uh, you know an example of that is Financial Peace University you think about all the ways we have done it over the years it started with an overhead projector and then went to VHS tapes and then to CDs and certainly we've got a full online initiative now and some iteration and stuff we haven't rolled out yet on that that's even going to be beyond that that's very cool and very cutting-edge but um, if we kept doing it in the internet age the way that we did then, it would not be here. Right. And so you've got to not change your principles, but change your processes. Mm -hmm. um, you have to kill the sacred cows every morning. You have to hear them mooing and shoot them. Eat them for breakfast. <laughs> that is great advice. And you ended up in publishing and radio. Two stupid businesses. <laughs> so talk about reiteration. I mean, you've had to reinvent things over and over again. Yeah. How do you... I mean, not freak out. Like, people tend to just freak out when an industry is disrupted. So someone's, you know, built something and they're finally profitable and then their industry gets disrupted and everyone thinks the sky is falling. But you never seem to have that reaction. Maybe it's just because I am a disruptor. Hmm. Yeah. And so it's kind of like I live in that tension all the time. I love it. Hmm. Um, I eat conflict for breakfast. So, I mean, I'll, I just, that kind of stuff. If something's running too smoothly, I'm scared. Oh. You know, it's it's about time to, to, to ruffle some feathers somewhere. I mean, nothing moves unless it's shoved, and there's always friction when you shove something. So there's always going to be somebody pissed off. You know, you just count on it. That's part of the game. And so, yeah, I, I you know, and it, with the radio show, talk radio, the radio industry has been so afraid of Internet broadcast and mm -hmm. podcast and so forth. They've been so afraid of it. And our data shows they shouldn't be afraid of it. I mean, the Dave Ramsey Show has... Uh, 18 months ago had about eight and a half million listeners mm -hmm. um, with about half a million on our podcast and we were putting out one hour podcast today. We put all three hours out of the podcast free. We've now had almost a hundred million downloads. Wow. And and it's averaging um, our weekly listenership podcast and terrestrial combined is now uh, about twelve and a half million. Mm -hmm. uh, three million of that is internet. Yeah. So, but what's happened is, is my terrestrial listenership's gone up. Interesting. Okay. And same thing happened when I went on XM or Sirius. Like, oh, satellite radio is going to destroy right. terrestrial. Right. It didn't. It's called because it, it, the consumer's going to listen to something the way they want to listen to it mm -hmm. in the world we live in, with iHeart, with Spotify, with podcasts, with iTunes, with their, and they're going to listen to it on demand when they want, how they want, and you don't get there. You know, the consumer's disrupting everything. You just kind of got to follow where they're all going and not, not put all your eggs in one basket. Like, we didn't go all the way to satellite when satellite radio came out, thank goodness, because it's not been <laughs> what they thought it was going to be. Right. Um, although we're glad to be on it, but it's not. it didn't take over the world, you know. And thank goodness we didn't abandon terrestrial and do podcasts. And thank goodness we did not do a podcast because it's three million a week. Yep. I mean, so, yeah, just be in the middle of disrupting stuff all the time and, and don't be afraid of it. It's like, that's, that's where we're going. The rate of change is, is the only thing that's constant. And if you don't stay in that, if you don't swim in that stream, 
you're going to die. Yeah. One thing I heard you say that I thought was really interesting too, kind of along those lines is um, some advice you had said that a lot of small business, they are, are told to invest everything back in. And you were saying that that's bad advice and don't do it. And so I think we need to touch on that for the listeners and viewers who have maybe never heard your perspective on that. Because I think it's it's everywhere. Invest everything back in the business, everything back in the business. That's from all this mythology, though. You read these these myths of these guys who started with, you know, they, they put their, la- their grandmother's, they mortgaged their grandmother's house and <laughs> yeah. they made it, which is stupid. Now, most of the time you lose grandmother's house when you do that. That's just dumb. Don't do that. But there's all this mythology of these guys who just barely made it in business. And crap, if you're just barely going to make it, you're probably not going to make it. I mean, so don't, you know, leave a little margin in your life. Yeah. And you need to hold some retained earnings in the business. And you certainly need to be taking some money home. Now, maybe not the first month or the first two months. or I mean, you can live a little while without it. But the, the reason for owning a business is to make money and take it home. I mean, yeah. where did we turn this into a hobby where we don't make any money on mm. it? That's nuts. So, of course, we want to make money with it. That's, it. that's the proof of the pudding to our spouse that this is working. Yeah. You know, I keep coming home with no paycheck and I'm tired. My wife's looking at me like, you're not right, you know. <laughs> so, you know, of course you need to bring some money home. And, of course, you need to set some aside in your retained earnings for continued growth and for the bumps in the road that will come. Yeah, absolutely. You don't drain the whole thing back out. Because when you live right on the edge, you fall off. Hmm. That's what it comes down to. And And so that's just... I, that aggravates me a little bit because I, you're right. There's in this small business thing, and you know you read these articles in these magazines and different things of how so and so started their business, and I won't name them. I mean, but they're they're like iconic almost of mm. <clears throat> how they were really very stupid in what they did, <laughs> but they just survived it is yeah. what it amounts to. And then that becomes iconic mm. instead of being wise and saying, "Hey, you can do business and be wise." Yeah. I mean, you're all in. It's hustle and grind. And you're going to dump the majority of your money back in to mm-hmm. start with. But, yeah. I mean, goodness gracious, feed your kids. Yeah. And set some money aside for the bumps that will come. So they're, they're the exception, not the rule. I think so. Well, we're sitting here in Ramsey Solutions. We've got your name right there. <laughs> you know, we, you've built a giant, amazing personal brand. And now you <clears throat> have subsequent under your umbrella, you know, your daughter's building her brand mm-hmm. and Chris and some others. So maybe give us some tips on people who have a message like you and want to build, you know, build a platform around that message? Well, we've figured out, and we really do believe this here, it's a, it's a value of ours, that messages without personalities to lift them are dry and they don't last. Most companies have a personality somewhere in them mm-hmm. that was a force of nature. That, that brought them to bear. Mm. Most movements, most pieces of material, uh, and this idea that you can somehow bring something up and there's not a person attached to it is, it, it somewhere there's a person attached to it. Now whether mm. you put them out front in the spotlight, whether it's just below or whether they're even under the surface, but there's a person attached to things that move. People yeah. are the ones that move the needle. Mm. And so uh, for that reason, we've not tried to put out any messages or product lines that don't have a person attached to them. And, and so even with something like Every Dollar, which has got about two million people using it now, our, our online budgeting tool, Rachel is the face of okay. Every Dollar. And she comes alongside that. It, it's got its own persona, it's got its own thing, but there's a personality that's assigned to that product to con, to be associated with it and to lift it. The, you know, the RIQ, the whole retirement space, Chris Hogan is assigned to that. Uh, in the Christian space, Chris Brown uh, with the true stewardship message and, mm. and with the business boutique for women, the, equipping women to make money doing what you love. Christy Wright is the, that, that could be a movement in and of itself because that's such a vibrant marketplace, that one there's a good example. And I, people are often tempted to take something like that and just give it a brand, business boutique, and then, you know, there's some people around it or whatever, but we put Christy out there as the tip of the spear. She's not the only messenger on the thing, but, um, but she's the mother of that, of that orphan. She rocks that mm-hmm. baby, and so that that has caused us to be able to win, and it gives us a, a succession plan mm-hmm. because it's, you know Paul Harvey Jr. seldom makes it, so <laughs> these guys need to have their own persona, their own tribe, their own portion of our tribe that loves them, and if there's an if that's wide enough, when I step out, then this thing goes another generation or two. 
Yeah, you've been talking a lot lately about legacy and passing things on, and obviously now your daughter's come into the fold, but I heard someone ask you about family and business, and you said that you went and researched and found that there's actually a lot of families who can do business well together. So maybe someone out there watching who's trying to bring something, you know, get something off the ground with their sibling or their aunt and uncle or whatever, what's your advice for family businesses? Well, don't believe the myth that family businesses fail more often than publicly traded. The truth is, the actual data is that the publicly traded companies fail hmm. more often than family business. Family business, generational family business, has a longer, uh, has better, lo- you know, longitude than than anything else. Uh, it's not magical, though. I mean, there's plenty of toxic stories. Here's the thing: your your family business is going to be no more functional or dysfunctional than your family is. So if your family's a bunch of screwed up crazy people, then you bring them into business, it's going to be a bunch of screwed up crazy people. Right. Duh. And, and so, you know, it's only going to be as functional as you all are and the level of respect you have for each other and those kinds of things. That's one thing we found in the data. Uh, another thing we found in the data is it's very, very important, as we've studied the ones that are successful, we're looking for best practices, for people to stay in their lane. Mm-hmm. And, and that means that if a husband and wife are working together, they can't have a husband and wife fight at work. It's off limits. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. And she can't come down there or he can't come down there and go, well, I'm the husband or I'm the wife. And when you're at work, you're not. You're the thing you are. You're the director of marketing or you're the CEO or whatever. So Mm -hmm. when I'm here, I'm the CEO. And my daughter, Rachel, is one of the personalities. And so she treats me in a meeting like the CEO. Mm -hmm. I treat her like I would one of the personalities. And her pay, the way her pay is calculated, is the exact same as Chris Hogan's. Hmm. the way it's calculated. Now, he might sell more or less books. She might sell more or less. They're not necessarily making the same money, but but their calculation per book or per speaking gig or whatever, exactly the same among all the personalities. My son Daniel sells uh, in our digital space, and he's on the same commission rate as everybody else, and he's not in meetings with me much. Because he's one of the sales guys, and I'm not, I don't, you know, if I'm in with all the sales guys, that's cool. He's one of them, he's there. But he reports to a sales manager who reports to a VP who reports to an EVP who reports to me. Yeah. And so, you know, he doesn't come to dinner at the house and go, well, so and so has happened down at the office. You know, that would be breaking chain of command, and, and, you know, we don't do that. So we wear hats. At, At dinner, I'm Papa Dave with the grandbabies. Yeah. And I'm bouncing one of them on my knee and giving them a hug and talking baby talk. And when I take that hat off and I put the CEO hat on, that's who I am. And so, you know, one of my kids does not need to sit in a meeting and roll their eyes like they <laughs> might about Papa Dave. You right. know, that, that's that's the kind of stuff. you got to stay in your lane. you got to stay in your roles. If you can do that and if you've got a fairly functional family, you can have a great time at business. Awesome. Such good advice. Now, we only have a couple more minutes, so let's wrap up with a few last questions. You've talked a lot about mistakes, making mistakes, making mistakes. <laughs> What's your advice for bouncing back after just a big, fat failure? Uh, I think if you just know, know that failure's coming and mm-hmm. go, you know, failure's not really failure unless you quit. If you quit, it's failure. If you don't quit, it's an experiment. Yeah. And we experimented on this. It didn't work. Eh, another one. Experiment on that. It didn't work. Eh, another one. We hired that guy. That was an experiment. Whew, bad experiment. You know, (laughs) get another one. And, you know, and you just try. Some of them break your heart more than others because Mm -hmm. you're invested emotionally into the experiment. Mm -hmm. And and so it feels like failure. It rips your heart out sometimes or it leaves a scar on your psyche or whatever. But, uh, you you know, it's not like you're flipping about it. Sometimes I'm flipping about it, though. It's just like, you know, (laughs) that sucked. It didn't work. Okay, let's do something else, (laughs) you know. And and, But it's if you look at it as I'm going to fail forward, Mm-hmm. as John Maxwell's book says, then you will. And I've met with so many of these people, whether they're uh, professional athletes or rock stars in the music world or they're big-time authors or speakers or business CEOs. Every one of them are colossal failures. Mm, yeah. I mean, they make they failed so much. It's unbelievable. They just didn't quit. And they yeah. just said, okay, that's not doing it that way. Not doing it that way. We're going to do it this way. Course correct. Course, that hurt. I don't want to do that. Ouch. You know. And you just course correct, course correct, and keep going. And, and it's so fun because really when you get on the gleaming mountain of success, you realize it's not really a gleaming mountain. It's more like a pile of garbage, and you're just standing on it instead of laying under it. Mm. And if you just keep looking at it that way, you go, okay, one more thing to stand on. Mm. One more thing to stand on. We're going to do better, and not we don't, we don't want to make the same mistake twice, hopefully. But even then, it was an experiment. Oh, yeah, now I did it twice. For sure not going to do it three times, you know. And you just you just keep going and adjusting and adjusting and adjusting, and it's course correcting, and... You bump into something, you turn, bump into something, and you turn, hit a problem. I was in a meeting the other day, one of our guys had a diagram of 
how many roadblocks he had run into on this thing. And then he, was, he wanted to completely change the whole thing. And I went, no, you're almost there. Yeah, you know, you've almost going. broken through. We figured out a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't work. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so you've been an entrepreneur and businessman your whole life. If you could try and sum up one best piece of advice for entrepreneurs and small business owners watching, what would that advice be? Hmm. Uh, that's a lot to ask in one question. It's a great interview question. Uh, <laughs> I knew you would say that. Yeah. Uh, don't be ashamed of making money. Hmm. If you if, if you got your heart right and, and your business is there to serve, really serve, you're not being manipulative, hmm. you're not being a jerk, but you really want to help people. You really want to help them with their heating and air. You really want to help them fix their car. You really want to help them as a life coach. You really want to help them get out of debt. You really want to help them dot, dot, dot with their photography. Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You really, you know, you're taking pictures of those babies and you love doing it. And getting that right shot for that mom or that baby. You know? And, and, you know, love people. And if you're doing that, they're going to give you, as my friend Rabbi Lappin says, certificates of appreciation with president's faces on them. Yep. And, you know, just don't be, don't be ashamed of making money if you're serving and be serving. And, and then the rest of it is just how do we do those things? How do we do those things? How do we serve so well that we're making money and then we're smiling and going, that's my report card. Uh, Ken Blanchard says that profit is the applause that mm -hmm. our customers give us. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I want to I hear my customer doing that. And, I'm, and so I'm not only not ashamed of making money, I'm ashamed if we don't because it means we didn't serve well. Mm. Something broke down. Man, there is a lot we can learn from Dave Ramsey, but here are my top few keys to success for the rest of us from my interview with him. Number one, put food on the table first. He recommends that entrepreneurs stay cautious and make sure that you can pay your bills. He waited four years before he did Financial Peace University full-time, focusing on his real estate business instead because he knew that would put food on the table. Number two, say yes to everything. We hear this a lot with successful people. He said yes to every opportunity he could to share his message at the beginning, especially when it came to speaking engagements. Number three, put in the hours. You heard him tell just how crazy his days were for the first two years or so when he was building his business. Just like all the other successful people I interviewed, there's just no shortcut around really hard work, focused work for a few years, you guys. Number four, figure it out as you go. I appreciated how many times he said, quote, we didn't know, or I didn't know. He openly shared about how many mistakes he made along the way and how they just had to keep figuring things out. So don't feel like you have to know it all before you get started. Just get started and figure it out as you go. Number five, have a mission. He said in the interview, they knew they were going to change the world. He had a mission that kept him focused so that he could stick through it through the hard time. So if you don't have a motivator other than just money, you've got to find a mission to keep you going. Number six, create a culture around that mission. He says that people think he's weird. People think his company is weird. That doesn't matter. They want to have the kind of company they want to have in order to serve his mission that he had at the beginning that he feels like he's called to do. The end. Number seven, focus on mission over method. I loved how he talked about killing the sacred cows, that you had to reiterate and do things differently and be innovative and just focus on the mission and the principles, but change the methods and the processes. Number eight, stick with it. Remember at the beginning, he had seats for 135 people and four people came, you guys. He had many failures and setbacks, but he says, if you don't quit, if you don't really quit, it's just an experiment that failed. It's not failure. Number nine, separate work and life, particularly those of you in family business. He says that their success is because they wear hats and when they're at the office, they treat each other one way and when they're at home, they interact another way. Number 10, I love this one. He said, don't fear success. This was an unexpected answer to my staple question about number one piece of advice. And he just says, don't be ashamed of making money because money is like your report card. If no money is coming in, it means you're not serving. It means you're not doing things right. So don't be afraid of success and don't be afraid to make money. Well, thank you so much. I know you have meeting, 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 meeting today, so I'm glad I could sneak in. <laughs> well, thank but you for coming. Yeah, this I'm has been awesome. I think there's, I mean, we can learn so much from you. So I'm Kelsey Humphreys here with the Dave Ramsey, and this has been The Pursuit. Mm -hmm.